The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's just before noon on a bright but blustery day in San Francisco. And Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite detective, instead of chasing criminals, is sitting peacefully in his office, academically discussing crime and its detection with his able and attractive associate, Phyllis Knight. And, oh yes, the inspector of homicide who has come to take them to lunch. You see, Inspector, I'm not criticizing the police department when I say that uh, I'm not bound by the rules that... Well, you, for instance, are bound. I realize that, Mike. I have to be pretty sure of my ground before I make an arrest. I have to have evidence enough to convince the district attorney, and he has to have reasonable prospects of obtaining a conviction before he goes to the grand jury. Plus the fact that you, Inspector, can be sued for wrongful arrest, whereas we, Mike and I, never arrest anybody. (laughs) We pass the buck to you. (laughs) I know. I know all that. But what I'm getting at is this. Mike has something in the way of, well, being able to nose out a suspect that we, well, that is most of us in the department, either don't have or else don't apply. The answer is simple. Proving it is difficult. Let's hear it in all its simplicity. Well, you and every other member of the department are so busy taking notes, which you have to do, that you get into the habit of reading what witnesses and suspects have to say. Whereas I, uh, I listen to their tones, uh, to their delivery... I strain my ears for the meaning behind what they say instead of the mere words. I'll admit all that. I think there's something else, Inspector. Although I hesitate to say this. (laughs) Don't spare my feelings, Phyllis. (laughs) No, I'm not thinking of your feelings. It's Mike's. Oh, don't spare mine, Angel. You never do. Hmm. Well, in spite of the fact that Mike hates criminals and hates crime, I think he has a criminal mind. Angel, what you just said. I mean it. Mike seems to be saying to himself... If I had committed this crime, how would I go about it? Or if I were the important clue, where would I be found? Well, that's not a criminal mind, Angel. That's just that I... Michael Shane, private detective. Hi, Phil. Is the inspector there? Oh, sure thing, Sergeant. For you, Inspector. Uh Uh-oh. Hope this doesn't break our lunch date. Hello, Sergeant. Reporter homicide, Inspector. man named Porter called up and said he found a body at 323 Foothill. Any idea who the murdered man is? Porter said the man's name was Beatty. Didn't give much more information. He seemed pretty upset, not too coherent. Okay, Sergeant. I'll meet you there as soon as I can get there. Homicide, huh? Yeah. Well, what do you want? Murder or lunch? Oh, don't be silly, Inspector. We'll pass up a whole week's meals for a murder any time. This is the street. Yeah. And that looks like the apartment. Right there, with a man standing on the steps. Yeah, that's it. No signs of your boys yet, Inspector. No, but then we were closer than headquarters. That must be Porter. Looks all upset. Well, wouldn't you, if you just found a body? Are you, uh, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes. I've been pacing up and down these steps waiting. I thought you'd never come. Where's the body? Upstairs, on the couch in his living room. This isn't your house, then? Uh, no. No, this is Mr. Beatty's house. Oh. You were visiting Mr. Beatty? I called to take him to lunch. When? Just before I called the police. Not more than uh, 20 minutes ago. In this way, please. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I, I, I went in, and there he was lying on the couch. There was a knife sticking out of his chest. I ran over to him, felt for his heart, and got my fingers all sticky with blood. You shouldn't have touched the body. Well, I didn't know it was a body. He might still have been alive. Had he been, I would have called a doctor before I called the police. That makes sense. Where is he, in this room? Uh, on the couch there. He, uh... Oh, but... But he must be. Body? There's no body on this couch. But no. he was there. Maybe you were mistaken. Maybe he wasn't dead. Oh, but he was dead. He was cold. He was bleeding. His, his heart wasn't beating. Ugh. What's the matter, Angel? Oh, there's blood on the couch. I just got my hand in it. So you're right. Here. Here's my handkerchief. Thanks. Well, if he was dead, someone must have removed him. But they couldn't, Inspector. 
There's only one entrance to the apartment through the front door. There's no back door to the apartment? No, and I've been here all the time. I I haven't been out of the sight of that front door since I discovered his body. I, I, I feel sick. I've got to sit down. Okay, okay, now calm yourself, calm yourself. I don't blame you for being upset. But we'd better get this straightened out. Mr. Porter, tell us what you did from the very start. Well, I, I told you, I, I came to take him to lunch. If he was dead, how did you get in? Well, the door was open, and that's funny, too, because he was always careful about locking and bolting it. Go on, go on. The door was open, so you went in. I found him, and when I saw he was dead, I, I, I phoned the police. You'll probably find my bloody fingerprints on the phone. Yes. Then what did you do? Well, I, I walked up and down, and I went to the front door. I came back and... Oh, I, I remember. I saw the mail lying in the hallway. I absently, almost unthinkingly, picked it up. Where did you put it? On the table there. Mm hmm. Huh? Oh, the wind must have blown it on the floor. There. That's it? That's it. Uh, then you did what? Well, that's all. I I walked back and forth, and I walked downstairs to the front door to look for the police, and then I'd come back. And you were never out of sight of that hallway and front door? No, not for one second. Well, it's a cinch that even Houdini couldn't take a body out this back window. That window was open? Yes. Oh. No signs of anything on the sill. No, and even if there were, Mike, look there. Workmen working on that building would be bound to see anything like that. Yeah, you're right, Andrew. You up there, Inspector? Yeah, come upstairs. Well, what do you think, Inspector? I don't know what to think. What's more, I don't know what to do. Well, what do you mean you don't know what to do? Well, to put it bluntly, how do I go about finding a murderer when I haven't even got a body? But there was a body, and there has been a murder committed. You can't talk like that about not doing anything. The man's right, Inspector. I know perfectly well he's right. Why don't you suggest something? All right. I will. What? Let's go hunt a body. We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. You know, you hear a lot about magical post-war products and how easy they're going to make your life. Well, friends, one such product is here already. Yes, that's right. It's Union Oil Company's Luster Wash, a product that makes washing your car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Using an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously over the car. Then, just rinse off with a hose, and you're all through. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. No fuss, no bother, no mess. Union Luster Wash is harmless to the car finish and to your hands, yet cleans as fast as you can apply it and without the usual elbow grease. Luster Wash is not a soap, but a special detergent compound which dissolves road film and traffic dirt on contact, leaving the surface clean and smooth. You'll be amazed at how fast it works and how clean it makes your car. A package of Luster Wash sells for only 10 cents and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can get Luster Wash at any Union Oil Minute Man station. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. <laughs> Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have been confronted with a murder, a man who saw the victim, but so far, no corpse. They've finished searching the apartment and stand looking at one another. Well, if there's a body in this house, it must be in small pieces and hidden in cracks in the walls. Uh, there's certainly no body in this apartment. But, Inspector, Mr. Shane, I, I, I saw it. We know. We know, Mr. Porter, but it isn't here now. Look, we've all had our say on the body. Let's change to something else. We've pretty well covered the apartment. Not only us, but the sergeant and his boys. We couldn't find a thing amiss. Ah, uh, granted. So, let's take a look at the murdered man's mail. Oh, here it is. I put it on this end table. Oh, thanks. Ad from Flower Shop. Oh, open this one, Inspector. Okay. Here's another ad. And uh, you open this one, Angel. All right. I'll tackle this one. Hey, Mike. What? Hmm? Listen, I warned you for the last time. Settle up or else. Sign. I can't read the initials, but the signature looks like Reynolds. Oh, that must be. Yeah? Tell us more. Well, I, I, I don't know very much, but Reynolds and another man by the name of Weaver went into some sort of a deal with B.T. They felt that B.T. had swindled them. Well, not in the way that they could go to law, you understand. 
but in such a way that Beatty didn't lose his money, but they lost theirs. And Beatty told me that he'd been threatened by them. He told me he was worried. But that was all. Why the dickens didn't you tell me this before? Well, because I, I, I didn't think it was important. You surely don't think that either Reynolds or Weaver would kill Beatty over, over a thing like that? We don't know, but it's our only lead so far. Wouldn't you say so, Mike? Oh, not exactly, but it's one we've got to follow up, of course. You'll return home, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes, of course. I'll be there if you need me. Okay. Let's go, Phil, Mike. We'll go in my car. Let's see. The address on this stationery of Reynolds is Stats Building. I'll stay behind, Inspector, just in case of any phone calls or anything like that. Right, sure, Sergeant. Um, doesn't anybody want to know what was in the letter I opened? Huh? Why, you little... I wondered why you were so quiet all of a sudden. What is it, Phil? Well, I didn't want to read it while we were in the room. You think we'd better wait till we reach the car? Oh, no, no, huh? We're out of earshot. Okay, shoot. It says, I don't suppose I should care what happens to you, but just the same, you are a fool. I've told you before that I don't trust Porter, and I'm more sure of it now than ever before. What's the signature? There isn't any. But although it's written on a typewriter, I'll make you a bet. What? What? I'll bet you this warning was sent by a woman. Eighth floor, please. Yes, sir, eighth floor. Number eight, sir. There's Reynolds' office right down the hall. Yeah, there's a man just going in. Yeah, we might be in luck. That might be Weaver. Something tells me that this isn't going to be very profitable. Well, we'll soon see. Yes? May I help you? We'd like to see Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds is busy just now. If you'd care to wait, he has someone with him. The someone with him isn't by any chance Mr. Weaver. Well, well, yes, it is, but how... Oh, you saw him come in just before you did. Then if it is Mr. Weaver, that's most fortunate, because we want to see both gentlemen. Well, I I don't know. I'll ring Mr. Reynolds. Please don't. We're on police business, and we'd rather go in unannounced. Oh, but I... I... Well, and to what do I owe this intrusion? Isn't my receptionist out there? Your receptionist isn't at fault, Mr. Reynolds. I'm from police headquarters. We'd like to ask a few questions. Police? What on earth for? You sent this threatening letter, Mr. Reynolds? Let me see. Uh, Yes, yes, I did. And I'll send more if I don't get satisfaction. Uh, Satisfaction for what, sir? I don't think it is anyone's business. It's police business, Mr. Reynolds. Now, we can all be very comfortable and save a lot of time by getting our answers here. But, of course, if you prefer headquarters, then that's your privilege. Oh, well, if Beatty has been fool enough to report this letter to the police, I'll tell you all you want to know. We'd like to know why you wrote the letter. Well, briefly, uh, Beatty, Mr. Weaver here, and I uh, put up equal amounts of money into an enterprise. It was at Beatty's inducement. Uh, Beatty had the inside track on the thing. He knew before we did that the venture wasn't going well. He withdrew his money without giving us a chance to withdraw ours. And the venture folded. It did, and... uh... Go on, sir. Reynolds and I feel that Beatty should share the loss with us. In other words, you feel that Beatty should split what he got out of the deal three ways with you two. Yes. Uh, Legally, of course, we can't compel him. Morally, we feel entitled to it. Uh, Where does Mr. Porter fit into this scheme? Porter? He doesn't fit in at all. He's just a real estate man who helped Reynolds find a warehouse. A personal friend of Reynolds? Well, yes. You said warehouse. Is uh, the warehouse being used, Weaver? No, no. We still have a lease on it, but the business folded three weeks ago. And the warehouse is empty? Yes, uh, quite empty. You have the keys. Uh, I do. Uh, You want to borrow them? Yes. Thanks. Now, one more question. Where is the warehouse? It's at 2200 Key Street. Beatty, Weaver, and Reynolds is on the signboard. Oh, boy, what a rat trap. Yeah, well, here's hoping it's more than just a rat trap. A man trap. Yeah, this looks like the key. Well, yeah, here we go. All right, now careful where you walk. Remember, they said the business folded three weeks ago. There should be enough dust on the floor to show footprints. Place is empty enough. There are footprints leading to that cubbyhole of an office. Well, leave us have a look, see. There's not a blessed thing in here, except this old table. 
Take a look, Phil, Inspector. Hmm? Yeah. You noticed how the dust is disturbed? On the edge of the table, next to the wall. That means that table was moved. Yeah. No, it may not mean a thing, but keep it in mind. Outside of that rickety chair out in the warehouse, that seems to be everything. No loose boards or hidden closets or anything? No, pretty much of a blank. Mike? Yeah? Inspector. Yeah? Here. Take a look at this chair. I, I may be wrong. But... What is it, Angel? Oh, oh, look, that spot. Dry, shiny. It, it looks like brown paint, but it... It could be blood, huh? It does look like blood. One single drop. If it is a blood spot, it dropped from quite a height. You see how it's spread out like a... Like a sea... Inspector. Yeah? That table. Let's get it out here, right in the center of the floor. Okay. Now, the chair on top of the table. Yeah. Mike, that ventilator in the roof. Right, Angel, right. I didn't notice it till now. Oh, it's a common failing. People never lift their eyes high enough. Now, give me a hand, Inspector. Okay. I hate to twist an ankle, even on a murder case. There. There. Any luck? Yes. Yes, blood on the edge of the vent. You need a flashlight, Mike? Uh -uh. Uh-uh. The body's here, all right. Close to the eaves and lying along the rafters. That'll do till the police surgeon gets here. Yeah, okay. Phil... Will you make an inventory of all the stuff as we search it? Mm-hmm. Shoot. Okay. Leather wallet, identity card, JJBD. Driver's license, age 52. Mm-hmm. I think... Yeah? I think he was stabbed twice, Mike. Once in the back, and that was the stab that killed him. Stabbed again in the chest, eh? Looks that way. Autopsy will tell us definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, pocket handkerchief. Okay. One or two? One in trouser pocket. One folded in breast pocket of coat. Mm-hmm. Got it. Checkbook, balance, $800.30. Any stubs to Porter, Reynolds, or Weaver? No, Mike. Seems to be all for light bills. Gas bills, department store purchases, things like that. Pipe, tobacco pouch, and book of matches. Yeah. Bill clip with $25 and loose cash. Three silver dollars, 90 cents, and two streetcar tokens. Old-fashioned gold watch and chain. Watch and gray, J.J. Beatty from fellow workers, Wadsworth plant. Kansas, 1913. Uh-huh. Fountain pen and pencil. And that seems to be it. Okay, then. That's all. Got it. Got it all down in my own inimitable shorthand. So, that's all, is it? What do you mean, Mike? Yeah. Why that cat that ate the canary look on your face? <laughs> Once before, I told you that something was so blamed obvious that I wasn't going to tell you what it was. Oh, we remember, Daddy. Okay, The same thing applies here. Now, come on, let's get going. I don't know where you'd like to go, but I'd like to put in a phone call. Who to, Phil? First, to Mr. Beatty's wife, if he has one, ex or otherwise, to see if she wrote that warning note to Beatty. One run? Go ahead. If no Mrs. Beatty exists, then to the little receptionist at Reynolds' office for additional... Two runs, no errors. I'm with you. Good. And I'd like to use a police teletype. I'm with you on that one, Mike. We'll teletype Kansas to see what associates Mr. Beatty had in the days of his past. But I'm still puzzled about what you seem to know that we don't. I don't know a thing that you don't know, Inspector. I'll give you one hint, just one. But you mustn't ask any more questions. I'll bite. Go ahead. Just put your hands in your pockets, Inspector. That's all. Just put your hands in your pockets. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. Ladies and gentlemen, a few minutes ago, we told you about a sensational new way to wash your car. Now, if you think that there can't be anything new about washing a car, well, just try Union Luster Wash. You see, Luster Wash is a special detergent compound that makes washing a car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Then, with an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously. To finish, you simply rinse the car with a hose. That's all. No rubbing or elbow grease is necessary. 
In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. Luster Wash cleans glass and chromium, too, which means you don't have to use a chamois afterwards. It's harmless to the finish and to your hands and leaves no film to dull the surface. No matter how dirty your car may be, Union Luster Wash will wash it as swiftly as you can apply it. A package sells for just 10 cents, one dime, and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Union Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can buy Luster Wash at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector are at headquarters. Phyllis is on the phone. Mike is looking at his notes, and every few minutes, the inspector guiltily puts his hands in his pockets, pulling them out again when he catches Mike's eye. Doggone you, Mike. You got me as self-conscious as a giggling (laughs) schoolgirl. It's your own fault, Inspector, your own fault. If the solution of the murder depended on it, I'd tell you right now, but, well, it's only one me. Hush, hush, kids. She's on the phone. Oh, who? The ex-Mrs. Beattie. Oh. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Beattie? Yes? Mrs. Beattie, don't hang up when you hear my question, because if you do, you'll be called right back, and that will be by the police. Yes. Go on. Uh, did you by any chance send a note of warning to Mr. Beattie? Well, Mrs. Beatty? Yes, I did. Why? Well, it's, it's hard to explain, but there was something about this Mr. Porter I didn't trust. Oh, I haven't seen much of Mr. Beatty these last few years, but I've met him socially several times when he's been with this man, Porter. Mm-hmm. Go on, Mrs. Beatty. Well, that's all. I have only a woman's intuition for not trusting Mr. Porter. He, he reminds me of someone. I can't remember who, but... Someone not to be trusted. And that's all? Honestly, that's all. Thanks very much. Well, there's not much there. She sent the note. But just womanly intuition made her distrust Porter. You think she was telling the truth? Yes, don't you? Uh, not entirely. Not the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes? A boss from Kansas, sir. Bring it in, Sergeant. Yes, Inspector. I'll get it typed up. Doggone, if there isn't something in the Kansas report, we're going to have a regular unsolved mystery on our hands. Wouldn't like to call in Sherlock Holmes or Father Brown, would you? Oh, Mike, this is serious. This is murder. I know it is, Inspector. Now, look, both of you. Yeah? Yeah? When we burst in on Reynolds and Weaver, they didn't show any signs of knowing that Beatty was dead. I mean, they were wholly taken up with the idea that Beatty had brought the police into it because of the threatening letter. That's right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Reynolds said that if that letter didn't bring results, he'd send more letters. Right, Angel, right. And although that could be cleverness, I'd be inclined to mark it down as truthfulness. You may be inclined to mark it down that way, Mike. But until we have the murderer in our hands, everybody who ever knew Beatty is a suspect in my little list. Granted, Inspector. But Weaver didn't hesitate to give us the uh, keys to the warehouse. Mm, You can't lay too much stress on that, though, Mike. Both Weaver and Reynolds knew that we could get into that warehouse without keys. True, true. But to be able to carry off their interview with us uh, with such savoir faire would indicate that they were very clever and very experienced crooks, which I, for one, don't believe they are. Yeah, yeah. But, Mike, murderers don't have to be crooks. Many a killing is a criminal's first and last crime. I know that, Inspector. I'm thinking out loud to convince myself. You see, what I... Yes, sir. Not much, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Let's see what this says. Only connection Beatty ever had with police was his witness in robbery trial. His testimony was essential in proving guilt of defendant. And the defendant's name was Porter. Yes, Phil, the defendant's name was Porter. Well, what are we waiting for? That's it. No, no, not quite, Phil. You see, Porter died in a penitentiary in 1936. Oh. Oh, well, then, of course, it isn't the same Porter. That Hmm. report doesn't say whether or not Porter had a brother. No, Mike, it doesn't. But I'd be almost willing to bet that he had... What so many women like to call woman's intuition is uh, nothing more or less than a half-forgotten incident or something half-heard and half-forgotten. You think that Mrs. Beatty's instinctive dislike for Porter is because of the name or a likeness between the Porter who found the body and the Porter who went to jail? Yes, Inspector, that's exactly what I do mean. Well, that shouldn't be hard to find out. But it still isn't the stuff that convinces district attorneys or grand juries. No, Inspector, but on the face of it, I think another interview is justified. Interview? Who with? All of our suspects, Weaver, Reynolds, Porter, and Mrs. Beatty. All right, Mike, we've got nothing to lose. We have everything to gain. You see, our chief suspect holds the key to this little mystery, and we'll find that key at 323 Foothill. Will I get a stand-wise? 
Quiet, please. Quiet. Now, to some of you, this is going to be somewhat of a shock. But Mr. Beattie has been murdered. What? We found the body in the warehouse you used, Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Weaver. But Mr. Porter had the distinction of finding it first, although he lost it again. Uh, will you take over from there, Mr. Porter? Well, uh, I, I came here this morning to take Mr. Beatty to lunch. The door was open, which was funny because he was very careful about locking and bolting the door. Mm -hmm. I came upstairs, found him lying on the couch, stabbed through the chest. I, I ran over and felt him to see if he was alive. Found he was dead and called the police. And got your fingers all sticky with blood? Yes. Uh, then I, I, I wandered about the apartment. Went downstairs to the front door to watch for the police and came back upstairs and picked up the mail. The mail which contained the threatening letter from Mr. Reynolds and the warning from Mrs. Beatty. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, anyway, when you arrived, we all came upstairs and the body was gone. It uh, couldn't have been taken out the front door because I was never out of the sight of the head of the stairs. And we know it wasn't taken out the back because there's no back door. Would uh, you have any explanation for that, Mr. Reynolds? Uh, no, no, I, I can't see how. Or you, Mr. Weaver? No, no explanation. And I'm sure that Mrs. Beattie hasn't. Oh, no, it's completely baffling to me. It was to us for quite a while. The reason it was baffling was because we were stupid enough to believe Mr. Porter. What? If you picked up the letters after you examined the body and after you phoned the police, how come there are no blood-stained fingerprints on any of them? But I... And with the wind blowing so hard that it blew the mail off the table, how come the front door was open? It would have blown shut. And if the body couldn't be taken out the back window and you never lost sight of the front door, how could the body be spirited away? I, I don't know. I don't know. That's the mystery. No, no mystery, Porter. Just a tissue of lies well rehearsed. The body never was here. But the blood on the couch. Put there by you after you had hidden the body in the warehouse rafters. Oh, this is absurd. You can't throw accusations around like that. We can and we will. Give me your keys. My keys? Yes, yes, the keys in your pocket. There, you see. When we searched Mr. Beattie's dead body, we found everything a man usually carries. A wallet, pen and pencil, watch, checkbook, handkerchief. But, uh, but, Inspector... Yes? No keys. No keys to get into his house or anything. Now, what Porter did with the rest of Beatty's keys, I don't know. But here's the key to the warehouse. Uh, F-24 is its number. It checks with the number of your keys, key, Mr. Weaver. Yes, that's right. And one of these two keys is the key to Beatty's apartment. This apartment. Shall I try them, Porter, or do you admit it? I... I admit it. Okay, Inspector. I guess that takes care of that. <laughs> early in the evening, and we're on our way home. Aha! But we're not on our way home, Angel. No? Where are we going? We're going to meet the inspector and have a late snack at Fisherman's Walk. Oh, good. Mike, I, I wonder if Porter is a brother of the man who died in the penitentiary. Oh, I'm sure of it. He'd better be. Why? Because if he isn't, we'll spend the evening talking to the inspector about motives. Oh. And what would you rather do, Mike Shane? Are you asking me or taunting me? Well, I just, uh, Mike. Huh? No, not here in the car. I mean... Why it... not, Angel? I can drive with one hand as well as the next. again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story, based on the character created by Brett Halliday, was written and directed by David Taylor. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.